Hello, my name is Max Moskowitz, and this is my podcast, Fighting with Moskowitz, or in Dutch, Vechten met Moskowitz. Uh, we are doing this podcast out of Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and uh, we have been focusing on the UAP phenomena because we're making a whole edition about the UAP phenomena for Nieuwe Revue magazine, which is a Dutch magazine. And we get to be uh, the rebellious ones who are actually addressing this very important topic. And today we are talking to a uh, former man in charge of the AA tip program uh, for the Pentagon, Mr. Louis Elizondo. Uh, he was a, a former Secret Service guy. He was chasing terrorists from 2008 up until uh, 2017. He was in charge of investigating UFOs, UAPs and everything surrounding that subject. This is a very open and uh, honest interview uh, Louis did with me. Uh, you might hear some really new things uh, about the UAP phenomena and what we can expect in the future, or maybe uh, what hasn't been said in the past. So uh, enjoyed this uh, interview and um, I hope you, uh, you know, get educated. Um, so three years ago, the, the, the Pentagon released these images and you must get this question a lot. Of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, I think, dude. I understand that it was actually uh, you who uh, decided to uh, release those images. Is that true? To some degree, that is true. Uh, it was actually a mutual decision inside my office. Uh, because I was the senior ranking person at the time, Obviously, the responsibility fell to me and the request was initiated by me, uh, but it was a mutual decision by, by all of us inside the ATIP program at the time to try to establish a, a, a repository, a library, if you will, at the unclassified level that would allow uh, some of the, the scientific minds outside of the Department of Defense to maybe look at some of these videos and help us determine what they are. Uh, but it was it was my name on the official documentation to to release those videos, that is correct. Out front now, the former Pentagon military official who ran the covert government program up until this last November, Luis Elizondo. Luis, thank you so much for your time tonight. I mean, first, tell us what the purpose of the program was and why it was so secretive. Sure. Um, the purpose of the program, uh, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, was really designed to do just that. Um, from a national security perspective, identify those things that we see, whether uh, we see them electro-optically, we see them with radar, we see them uh, as, uh, as eyewitness reports, um, through a myriad of different ways and avenues that we receive the information and try to ascertain and determine if that information is a potential threat to national security. Uh, you, were, you were running AA tip. Um, is that true? You, you were in charge? Yes, sir. I was. Uh, uh, but to, to, be, to be completely honest and forthcoming, there were a lot of very, very talented people that I had the opportunity to work with. And uh, although I was the senior ranking person, a lot of the decision making we made was based upon consensus. Um, this was a very important topic, and I don't think any of us had uh, all the answers. And so it was important whenever we made a, a, a major decision that we made that decision as a group. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start this off with questions you probably get a lot, but I, I, I will move to no more, uh, uh, because, you know, I have a, a public that doesn't know anything yet. <laughs> you know, it's basically the sure. situation here. Um, so, uh, can you tell me a little bit more uh, about AA Tip? You were probably uh, screened and selected to 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 run this. Um, why did they choose you to do this? Were were you experienced in that field of of UAP UFO? Yeah, no, actually, I, I wasn't at all. Uh, initially, when I was asked to to come on board the program. Uh, it wasn't in the capacity as as the leader. It was in the capacity to provide security and counterintelligence support. Uh, my background as a counterintelligence investigator, I spent much time uh, of my career uh, chasing terrorists and, and spies. And as a result of that, 
uh, they they needed a a good counterintelligence representative inside the portfolio to make sure that our foreign adversaries hadn't penetrated uh, our our operational security. Furthermore, uh, I did have some background early on in my career as a as a young special agent. Uh, I did some work in advanced uh, aerospace technologies, primarily technology protection. So. Uh, advanced unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, some of the, the guidance systems for our cruise missile technology, uh, ICBMs, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and some, uh, some avionics. And so I suspect it's because of that background that they asked me initially to come on board in 2008. It wasn't until 2010 that I was asked to assume the lead role. Okay. Um... And before you started uh, that job, did you have any uh, uh, experience with UAPs or UFOs? Were they, has there... ne- negative. And in fact, I never even had the luxury to think about them. Uh, I remember distinctly on my, my interview uh, with the, the former director before I became the director, he was interviewing me. And I still had no idea what, what, the, what the portfolio, what the, what the job uh, was about. And he asked me, uh, I remember this, he asked me point blank. He asked me straight to my face. He said, what do you think about UFOs? And my response was, I, I don't. And he asked me, well, what do you mean you don't? You, you don't believe in UFOs? And I said, no, sir, I didn't say that. What I said is I, I, I don't have the luxury to think about them. I'm, I'm, I'm too preoccupied with my regular job, which is finding and chasing bad guys. You know, I, I'm not really, uh, I, I never had the luxury to, to, to think about UFOs, uh, whether they exist or not. Is something I never really pondered because I, I never really had the time. When you were briefed on on the job, um, <laughs> that must have been a, an awkward experience to to you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one way to put it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it was uh, go ahead. Oh no, I, I just wanted to know what you were feeling at that moment. Uh, I'm going to put this on do not disturb, so I can I can talk to you. I apologize, my phone keeps ringing. Um, you know, I, initially when he when he mentioned that, uh, and I, I began to realize what the portfolio was about, I wasn't sure if it was a test to see if maybe I was psychologically unstable, to see if I was prone to to uh, psychological flights of fancy. Um, so I was just honest, you know. And again, my response was exactly how I felt. I, I never really thought about UFOs. As I began to learn more about the portfolio and see a lot of the evidence, I began to realize that the evidence was very compelling uh, and that the topic was very real. Keep in mind that my background as a, as a special agent was very much, uh, in my country, we call it just the facts ma'am kind of, kind of person where I'm not interested in suppositions or what you think or what you feel. I'm interested only in the facts. You know, what, what, what does the data reveal? What can we see? What can we collect? What can we intercept? What can we record? Uh, and then use that information to make a logical conclusion. In this particular case, you have uh, what, what's so compelling to me is that you have highly trained observers, pilots, that we spend literally, literally millions of dollars each year in training these individuals. Some of them go to the very best schools like Top Gun. And in fact, I'll show something. I'll share something with you and your audience here. Yes, please. This is an example of our trained observers, uh, the, the, the training uh, type they do. So this is a profile. These are our US government cards on identifying foreign military aircraft. And you have to be able to identify these aircraft from all different angles, from all different sides, all different perspectives. And that's why our pilots and those also in your country are able to identify a SU-22 versus a MiG-25 versus an F-16 you know, or a European tornado from 20 miles away because of silhouettes they're trained to recognize. Furthermore, yeah. when you have a pilot reporting something that they've never seen before that can outperform anything that we have, which is further substantiated by, by video evidence, gun camera footage, which is then further uh, validated by radar data. And by the way, not just one radar, multiple radars in different locations. You now have three separate collection sensor units, the human being being one of them, three collection sensor units. You have radar, cameras, and pilots all reporting the same thing 
at the same time, at the same location, under the same circumstances. So if this were to be a, a, a court of law, uh, we would, in, from our perspective, be well beyond reasonable doubt. We, the jury would have to convict. This is, this is a real thing operating in, in real space and time. Um, and that, for me, I think was probably the most compelling because what we were seeing was the technology was, was sufficiently advanced beyond our, our, our current, not only our current capabilities, but our current understanding of aerodynamics and physics. Yes. Um, so these, these pilots, and it, was, it wasn't just like five guys who were like, you know, dozens of guys who, who uh, were witness uh, to UAPs. Uh, so the what you are looking at is facts, right? So you have okay, they were observed with senses, with eyes, ears. Then you have data, you know. Uh, so what pops up on the radar, satellite, um, and camera. Is there also signals you can uh, uh, observe, or hear, or uh, trace? That is a great question. Great question. Uh, unfortunately, I have to be very careful what I say here. What you're referring to is what we call signatures collection. The, the collection of data resulting from an object moving through space and time, whether it's electronic signature or it's a physical signature like heat ablation or atmospheric ionization or acoustic signatures like sonic booms. Those are all things that we consider. Uh, unfortunately, I can't go into a lot of detail on those. Uh, but yes, that is certainly very relevant. Um, having more collection sensors with more capability to collect the data is obviously going to give you a more compelling picture of what's going on. Yeah. Um, I can't, again, comment specifically what type of sensors we might or might not have used, but, but you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, you know, and, and, if I, the, and, here. And, and if I would just throw out a word, gravity. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a good one for sure. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's um, very very relevant. I'll leave it at that. But you're that's uh, yep. You're 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 obviously tracking. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm gonna <laughs> drop this subject uh, for you. Um, <laughs> let me see. Um, oh yeah, they, w w I. I think uh, I wanted to ask you, um, when you started the job, um, were you briefed on uh, the files uh, that were before you? Uh, I mean, did you have access to the files before you, maybe the files decades before you? Uh, no, we, we did not. Uh, it was very much a, a, a current, op we call current operational picture. Our focus was really twofold, very simple mission. What is it and how does it work? Uh, we weren't interested in origins or who's behind the wheel or intent at that point. But we we're just trying to identify what are these objects and how do they work. Um, as for us, we did not have the historical documents. Uh, we were aware of them, but we did not necessarily have access, nor did we use them. Because really, our job was to provide a current threat picture for our leadership as to what these things are. Uh, and the historical information, although very interesting, uh, you did not have the fidelity or the capabilities then like we have now. We did not have the high-resolution cameras, the, 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 the multi-spectrum radar capabilities that we have now. So a lot of it was just eyewitness reports. And although eyewitness reports are important, um, obviously having collection, technical data collection is, is, is also extremely compelling and very important. And that's what we were focusing on. Okay, so it was in the here and the now, uh, you, you were uh, focusing on, on those cases? <clears throat> Correct. Um, so when, when you focus on, on, on current cases, aren't you, weren't you uh, curious uh, 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 about what, what your... Predecessors, correct. Predecessors, sorry. So when it's late, my English just drops a little bit. Um, <laughs> so... Predecessors, um, weren't you curious what, what their data was, what they picked up on? Well, sure. But at the time, the only predecessors we were really aware of were those part of Project Blue Book. And that had closed decades and decades before we had started our program. So, yeah, but, uh, and, and sorry, that had already, 
and but I thought you had one uh, a couple of pre uh, programs just before you uh, OSAP it was or? yes yeah but that was really part of and ATIP and OSAP began as the same right. and then as OSAP faded away ATIP took over so you know when when you say ATIP I'm I'm assuming or presuming you're also lumping OSAP into that that right. we had access to clearly uh, but I thought you were talking about you said decades beforehand and so those were. Yeah, those were programs that were. I, I I understood that between Blue Book and uh, uh, AATIP, there were, of course, uh, secrets. Now, now we know that correct. Now now we yeah. know that there were some efforts ongoing. But at the time when I was at AATIP, we we were not. I certainly was not privy to that. I think a lot of people presumed that was the case, but again, we were very much focused on the here and now. And it wasn't until later that I had it confirmed to me that there were. Or some other efforts in the past, uh, after Blue Book, but before our program. And and were there agencies you know of uh, uh, operating uh, parallel to AA Tip? You know, maybe you know other organizations no. you were not communicating with. Not that we were aware of, and to this day, there doesn't seem to be anybody who has come up and said, "Yeah, we were doing the same thing." So, I think at the time, A Tip may have been the only program. Uh, it wasn't the only program forever, but during the time, it was a, it was it was established I, i think it was probably at the time probably the only program going on uh but I, i could be wrong um that's that's just the best of my knowledge we we asked the question many many times at the highest levels and uh we never we never received a, a response okay so from the moment you started when was the first time you realized this is a real thing well what case made you uh convinced that you were dealing with something unknown, something that might be from Earth, but could also be something that's not from this uh, planet. <laughs> yeah, there, it wasn't any particular case. Each one was compelling on its own. Um, obviously, when you, 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 you have a video and, and you have an object 50 feet away from the cockpit, um, that's very compelling. But it, it, it's not just one case. Um, every time we investigated a, 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 a case that was very compelling. It was usually followed by another one that was just as equally compelling or even more compelling um, because they're so different. E each one of these, there's some, there's some commonalities that we identified, but there were also differences. And um, each one of them were, were, were unique to some degree and, and, and again, equally compelling. Can I ask what case stood out for you the most in your uh, career at AA? Well, I can't talk about that one because <laughs> it hasn't been made public yet. <laughs> okay, um, but um, yeah, uh, there were there were quite a few cases that were were to me very very interesting and, and worthy of uh, of further research and inquiry. Okay, um, so. I, 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 you've been studying those cases for, for a couple of years. Uh, by the way, if I'm taking too much of your time, just tell me. Um, no, no, you're fine, Max. Please, <laughs> I'm here for you. Thank you, Mr. Elizondo. I'm, oh, I'm, 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 I'm just Lou. Everybody knows. I'm not Mr. Elizondo. I'm, 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 please call me just, just call me Lou, whatever right. is comfortable. Thank you, Lou. <laughs> um, okay. So... Um, okay, so you don't know if there were any parallel uh, agencies uh, uh, researching this subject in the United States, but are you um, aware of any foreign uh, government uh, 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 having a, an agency working on the subject? Yes. Yeah. Were it multiple governments? <laughs> yes, multiple governments. That's I know, I know some, were, were, some were allied uh, to the U.S., some were... Uh, Some were adversarial to the United States. Yeah, I I, I know for a fact the French the Fre the French I think uh, they have a very open uh, uh, research uh, organization. I think so. Do the Russians? At least they did in the past. Yeah, uh, I have to be very careful what I what I what I say publicly about other countries' capabilities and intents. What I will say is that this is a topic that's 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 uh, of global concern. Um, it's not just the United States that's interested in this topic. There are other countries as well. And did you for, work together? For, uh, boy. Or maybe exchange you're information? Some, you're asking really good questions. Um, 
Sorry about that. Let me sidestep that. No, no, it's great. (laughs) Listen, I mean, you're asking fantastic questions. Unfortunately, some of these I have to be very careful because they're, they're, they're sensitive and it's, it's like a child, um, and with two divorced parents, um, you know, in order to get permission to, to watch TV, the child needs permission from both parents, not just one. So uh, for me to elaborate on what type of information sharing agreements existed, uh, would, would probably not be prudent for me, uh, especially, you know, in light of the fact that maybe, maybe there's some countries that are still kind of sensitive to this topic. So I wouldn't want to put them in a, in a, in an uncomfortable position by either confirming or denying their, their participation. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it with a, with a polite pass and, um, I'll <laughs> great question. Great question. Thank you. And I, I, I don't want you to compromise anything. Uh, uh, yeah, know. no, no, I appreciate it. I won't. I'm, I'm very careful not to do that. And again, your, your questions are, are phenomenal. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I got some more. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, let me see. Um, oh, yeah. So I, I did a FOIA request uh, uh, to, to our uh, defense forces, the, the, the Dutch military. So they uh, responded and uh, they said they, that our forces have never uh, uh, witnessed or spotted uh, any UFOs. But when I asked uh, uh, if there m- m- might, might be another qualification for what they saw, they say, yeah, what we do see some unknowns. <laughs> so it's basically the same, I guess. Uh, it's just they have, an <laughs> they have another qualification for it. So, you know, the, the, I think the term UFO doesn't pop up in any, you know, uh, FOIA requests. So they, they just call it unknown, right. but to take the topic seriously, even if they want to take the topic seriously, uh, it's very difficult because uh, their peers, when they hear the term UFO, tend to uh, react in a negative manner. And so it's, it's understandable they're very risk averse. Yeah. So the, the reason I'm asking you uh, is because my, uh, uh, my friends, uh, Bram Rosa and Alex Griffioen, they run the uh, UFO hotline in Holland. It's basically a website Whenever people uh, spot something, they can, uh, you know, uh, um, put it on their website uh, with a picture or maybe a, a film or just a, a, descri- uh, a description. Um, but uh, they also have a map and, you know, you can see exactly where uh, people are making an uh, announcement they saw something. And in Holland, there is a very clear pattern. We have a couple of military uh, air bases and... Some known, but some uh, unknown. Let's say it's re- restricted. <laughs> that, that, that's sure. where the, there's uh, nuclear weapons, right? So there's a very, you know, th- those those spots in Holland are actually like the red hot spots where where there's the most activity, at least where people you know will will uh, notice them. And there's one in particular. Uh, it was Susterberg. In the Cold War, the Americans stored um, nuclear uh, rockets there in in uh, in secret. It's, it was a uh, very uh, top secret. But there was the the biggest case ever in Holland in 1979. Uh, a UAP showed up, the, the size of a football field, not making noise, and 13 Dutch military were witness to that. Also, civilians in the area. Uh, now, uh, this is a clear pattern. Uh, are you aware of any UAP uh, activity in Holland or, you know, U.S. officials, you know, um, say, telling about UAP uh, activity in, in Holland or the Netherlands? Uh, again, for the same reason that I, I want to respect the positions of uh, our, 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 our foreign allies, uh, I would never want to speak on behalf of, of the Dutch government. Um, but, uh, I, I suspect if you poke around a little bit, um, there has been some, some activity certainly. Um, and you know, you make a very interesting point about the connection between nuclear technology and UAP activity. That's a pattern that we continue to see repeated over and over again around the globe. Yeah. And I also talked to Robert Salas. <laughs> sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know, he, Robert. 
Yeah, yeah, of but course. But you know, that's not the only time that's happened. And furthermore, the uh, the folks on the other side of, the, of, of our pond uh, in Russia have had their own encounters as well uh, and involving uh, their nuclear technology. Again, I won't go into too much detail, but um, there, there seems to be a global pattern here. Yeah. And uh, clearly from, from a Dutch perspective or a U.S. perspective or even Russian perspective, you know, our, our nuclear technology is, is often, often considered our crown jewels. Um, it, is a, it is a first line of deterrence uh, into all-out warfare. Um, whether we agree with it or not, the fact is that countries maintain these, these destructive devices to, to secure and ensure the peace, um, even though it may seem a little bit uh, contradictory at times. Um, that, is, uh, that is the philosophy that many countries have adopted. And if you have a technology that has the ability to interfere with that nuclear capability, then clearly um, that's going to be uh, that's going to raise some concern for a lot of countries, uh, and rightfully so. Definitely, um, it's it's extremely dangerous because it it doesn't even have to be uh, uh, someone's fault. Maybe there's like a uh, uh, you know the, something goes wrong technical technically. And you're talking about a nuclear weapon uh, and, and we're in big trouble. Um, I mean, well, let's put this in real terms of, let's say right now, the relationship between India and Pakistan, mm. where they are on not such friendly terms. Imagine if a, a UAP were to interfere with one side's nuclear technology. And unfortunately, it's perceived as a provocation of war by the other side. Uh, you can see how dangerous that would be, right? Where right, right, we have yeah. one country have this some sort of UAP activity and it's misconstrued to be some sort of enemy attack. Uh, that's, that's very dangerous. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a very extreme, but, but potential scenario that we have to pay attention to. Yeah. Um, by the way, were you um, acquainted with the Dutch Susterberg case I, uh, from 1979? I, I, I am, I am aware of it. Yes. Okay, and then on a, on a let's say a top ten uh, worldwide case, would it, would it be in the top ten? Um, you know, it depends on on your qualifications for ranking. Uh, are we talking about uh, the number of eyewitnesses, credible eyewitnesses? Are we talking about uh, the performance? Are we talking about uh, capabilities and intent? Or are we talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, its significance towards national security? Depends how you qualify that when you say top 10. It's well, certainly let's significant. The, let's say the biggest you know, pound I, for pound case. <laughs> I mean, I would say also that, you know, the, the, the triangles uh, that were seen uh, as well in the 90s was a, was a fairly significant event over Europe. But there's been a lot that have never been... been been, that have come out and, and seen the light of day. Uh, there's, you know, it'd be very interesting. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say much more than this, but, you know, it should be interesting to know what NATO has has seen over the years, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. And it, by the way, it was a triangle. <laughs> so, but you knew that. <laughs> uh, let, let me see. Um, okay. Uh, at, at some point... Um, you know, there was a decision to disclose um, the Fleur camp footage of, uh, you know, the, uh, some pilots, uh, David Fravor, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and some more. I have the, the other, one of the other names here, too. Commander Underwood, I think. Jim Slate. Underwood. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's quite a few. Yeah. Um, so before that time, you know, this was always in the paranormal... Uh, you know, conspiracy theory, little uh, thing. Um, but not, okay, so in 2017, you you uh, shared these images with uh, the New York Times or the Pentagon did. Um, what and why uh, was the decision made to to you know make the people aware of this? This is a real thing. Well, uh, I, I did not release the, the videos to the New York Times. That was that was somebody else. Um, I suspect, you know, the 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 purpose of it was to to gain increased public awareness of this topic and the seriousness of it. 
Um, unfortunately, the bureaucracy inside the government at the time was very restrictive and did not allow this certain information to get to the right people in the right places so they could make an informed decision. And from a command control perspective, in the, in the, in, from a governmental perspective, that's a failure. That, that's, uh, the system is broken. Um, and so the only way uh, to fix it sometimes is to, to shed some light on the problem and do it in a way where you don't compromise sources and methods, you don't violate your, your secrecy oath, but you still have a conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe increase the aperture for, for greater transparency. Ultimately, this is a topic, in my opinion, that, that uh, doesn't belong under the providence of any particular government or organization or institution or religion. It belongs to all of us equally. It involves humanity, and it's a global issue. And uh, if that's the case, then why not, why not have a global discussion like we're doing right now? Um, yeah, and thank you for that, uh, you know. Um, so th this was basically a political move. <laughs> um, to share those uh, uh, images, you know, or, or maybe to to press um, to put some pressure on on certain uh, areas of the government, maybe. Um, so, if you, so this is a really, uh, I, I think, moving thing because this is going to change everything about man, mankind, what we ever all we knew uh, is going to be totally different. Um, <clears throat> I, I was wondering, is there maybe also a, uh, a, let's say, a reason to share this because there might be way more uh, encounters uh, coming uh, and we need to be prepared? Well, uh, you know, that's, that's a question that's often asked. Uh, why, why now? And uh, why this way? And my response is, why not now? Uh, you know, this is a discussion that I've said before is, is, is not like fine wine, where the longer you keep a cork on it, the better it gets. Um, I think this is a conversation that's a little bit like uh, old fruit or vegetables in the refrigerator. Um, and the longer it stays in the refrigerator, the more it stinks, it begins to rot. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's been quite a few decades that this fruit has been sitting in the refrigerator rotting. Uh, it's, it's not going to smell any better. Uh, we, we probably need to, to clean the fridge out, uh, refrigerator in my, my opinion. Uh, and so, uh, maybe this is a way to have the conversation begin, um, and, uh, allow people to digest the, the fact that um, these things are real, that, that UFOs, UAPs are real, without going to any preconceived conclusion of what it is or where it's from or what their intentions are, uh, we, have, we have still some way to go to answer those questions. First, we, we need to recognize the reality that these are real. And once we, 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 we recognize that as a people, as a society, then collectively we can have the conversation to determine what we want to do about it, if anything. Okay, and uh, okay, so we we're not saying it's extraterrestrial, <laughs> but we're not saying it's not. It is. It is highly. There's only three scenarios. It's either our technology here in the U.S., and uh, if so, then we've got some significant problems because we have failed time and time and time again to coordinate the testing of this exotic technology in and around our other our other capabilities. Uh, you have an entire, cap an entire organization called the Joint Chiefs, <clears throat> where their job is to deconflict and make sure that we don't step on each other's toes. Uh, and certainly, if this is some sort of secret U.S. technology and we're flying it over major populated areas, uh, then it's not really so secret, is it? Um, you, what we do is if we have secret technology, we test it at places like Area 51, where people aren't going to see it. We don't test it over major metropolitan areas. Yeah, so that's or, one scenario. Yeah, or but, white... Why take out your own nuclear bombs? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Why take out your own nuclear bombs? Exactly. So, so the chances are very, very, very slim, very minimal that it's our technology. The other option is that it's foreign adversarial technology. And if that's the case, we, we have a bigger problem than we had before because now our national security apparatus, despite our very best intelligence and humans and SIGINT and, 
Elint and Imint and all the different disciplines of intelligence have failed, have failed to something to the scale of 9-11, of September 11th, where the organizations have been caught completely off guard by some sort of revolutionary technology that some adversary has developed. And by the way, they've had it for decades. And by the way, we have failed to report this to Congress. And by the way, we have failed to report this to the head of our intelligence community. And oh, by the way, we have failed to report this to the head of our Department of Defense, right, and national security. So there'd be a whole bunch of series of failures there that, um, you know, would, would certainly uh, put us at any disadvantage if, if we were to go into any type of real major conflict. The third option is that it's not our technology and it's not adversarial technology. Technology, It's, it's something else, completely different, something completely and totally separate from, from our own technology as, as, as a people. Um, and it's looking more and more probable that that may be the scenario, that may be the situation we're dealing with. We're dealing with a technology that is, is not necessarily human, perhaps. Sure. Um, how would you describe the pattern of behavior of these uh, uh, vehicles? Is it like uh, ob observant of, of whatever we do, you know, the military or, or uh, people? Is it um, uh, maybe aggressive, violent, or is it uh, maybe protective, trying to contain us for, from harming ourselves, maybe? I think, um, I think that's a question that um, if you ask anybody out there, you'll get different, different opinions. Um, at the end of the day, we simply don't know uh, whether it's good or bad. Uh, or, or, or something in between. The bottom line is that if this was a, 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 if these aircraft had a Russian star on the tail or a North Korean tail number, and they were flying over major U.S. populated cities, it would be a significant geopolitical issue. Uh, we would have hearings uh, um, on the Hill. We would have calls to action. We would, uh, it would be very provocative. Uh, in some cases, it could be considered an act of war, right? So, Yeah. Um, you know, from a national security perspective, I, I think we need to, to, to look at this for what it is. It's a capability well beyond anything that we currently have in our inventory, whose intent we haven't figured out yet. So for us, we, our presumption is that it could be a threat if it wanted to be. So we probably need to figure it out. Um, you know, as far as overt hostilities, well, again, it depends who you ask. If, if, If I come over to a particular country and I take their nuclear weapons offline, that's a pretty provocative act. You know, that's that's not a friendly act. Uh, but then again, you know, if you are uh, if you are somebody who is against you know nuclear proliferation, then one could argue, well, they're actually doing it for our own good. Yeah, um, but because when when my son plays with matches, I'll I'll, I'll take it from him. <laughs> sure, right. Yeah, and, and that's you know that's that's a that's a, that's that's good reasoning, uh, but typically when you take matches away from your son, you explain to him why you're taking the matches away and and the dangers with it, right? You just don't take the matches out of his hand and not talk to him. You explain to your son, look, these are dangerous. Look, if you play with these, you can burn the house down. You can hurt yourself. You can hurt other people. Um, we don't seem to see that. Uh, it's just you know taking matches out of people's hands. Yeah. And by the way, letting other people still have matches. So I, I, again, I, I understand I, I'm not trying to sow fear into the hearts of anyone. Uh, I'm trying to be pragmatic. Um, you know, another instance is that there's a lot of people out there who claim that uh, they have had interaction with these things. In fact, there are some people, there's a subculture of people uh, that call themselves abductees or, or experiencers who claim to have had up close and, and personal contact with these things. And if that's the case, and they've been taken away from their own, against their own free will, in my country, we call that kidnapping. That's a crime. Right. And furthermore, if, if, if I were to touch you against your free will, well, now that's assault. You know, that's, that's another crime. So uh, I, I, I find it very difficult to assume one way or another that it is or it is not a threat. So I prefer to presume that it could be if it wanted to be. So let's try to figure this out. Was AA Tip also involved in investigating uh, abduction cases? Uh, 
No, not directly. It was uh, there was a portion of ATIP that focused on what we call biological effects, and that includes anything from a, a blade of grass on the ground to uh, to an animal to to a human being. Has there ever been uh, been uh, how do you say this in English? Has there ever been uh, uh, DNA has that been investigated to see if something is not human, not uh, maybe from a from an animal? Has has there ever been DNA found that is unknown to us? Well, I think the premise of DNA is is already uh, we need to be careful when we say DNA because DNA is is a terrestrial thing. Living things, living organisms on this planet have DNA. Yeah. Um, But that doesn't necessarily mean that all life forms in the universe would have DNA to test, right? So or, or yeah. look, at a, look at a virus. A virus doesn't have DNA, but it has RNA. That virus replicates like a living thing, and it reproduces, and it has a lot of the similarities and functions of survivability that a living thing has, but it has no DNA. It has RNA. And in fact, there's other living things that don't have DNA or RNA. So... You know, we, we have to be careful when we assume that everything is going to be playing by our rules, biologically speaking. I, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. Yeah, of course. You know, it, it doesn't mean like, uh, in theory, other life forms have have, the, have to have the same uh, uh, circumstances as we as humans have. You know, maybe they, they are uh, accustomed to another totally different climate or, you know, maybe... Uh, right. can live without some things we cannot live uh, uh, without. Um, but is there some uh, maybe uh, equivalent to what DNA is to us you maybe have been investigating at the time? Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and pass on that question only because uh, I don't think the answer would be, um, be satisfying. Um, we looked at a lot of things in the early days, particularly under the OSAP umbrella of ATIP, uh, we looked at a lot of things and a lot of things were, were, were very interesting, very compelling. But at the end of the day, uh, I can only speak on behalf of ATIP and my time in ATIP and my function in ATIP. And during my time at ATIP, our focus was primarily on the, the nuts and bolts of, of the UAP phenomenon. Okay, sir. Um, let me see if I'm, I, If you need to stop this, you just tell me. No, nope. I'll respect. Go it. ahead. I know. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, okay. So we 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 touched down on this a little bit just yet. Um, but why does the U.S. government make, um, in comparison to to the past, such an uh, effort to make the 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 people aware of this is something that that is happening or going on right now and it might be real eh? so UAP, UAP, uaps are definitely real what they are might be extraterrestrial too you know we have to take that into account you know they want us to know this could be a real possibility why now and why not before well i i, I think that this is a conversation no one really wanted to have for a very long time Uh, and again, going back to my analogy of rotten fruit in the refrigerator, um, I think it's, it's, it, it's becoming so apparent that the reality of UAPs is, is real that the government now is in an interesting situation that the longer it keeps it secret, the more people will begin to distrust the government. Um, yeah. it, it is very important for, for people to trust their own government. When people lose faith and confidence in their government and their institutions, um, the end is usually near and for that for that organization. And so I think there are people in the government that realize that um, as, as technology continues to proliferate and everybody now has a smart device in their hand, and, uh, it, it's becoming um, the evidence is becoming overwhelming. And, yeah. and we probably need to have this conversation like yesterday, um, because what we don't want to do is be on the wrong side of history. We don't want to get to a point where we say these things aren't real. And all of a sudden, you know, you have a mass sighting where 300,000 people over, let's say, Los Angeles, see something that, you know, is, is clearly not an F-18 or a helicopter or, or, or drone or something like that. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, we just talked about the behavior of the, the object. <laughs> um, but uh, I've, I've been talking to um, uh, James Fox and Jeremy Corbell, and they gave me some information on these things don't seem to have any propulsion systems. Um, it, it doesn't have any action reaction device devices, but it, uh, and it taunts all rules of gra uh, gravity uh, we are, we know of. And uh, like David Traver described, it seems to be, uh, you know, like disappearing in a split second and popping up in that same second kilometers or, or miles away. Um, right. Is that speed or is that the bending of space and time? Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, let's talk very briefly about the five observables. Five right. observables are the five fundamental characteristics that in ATIP we were able to solidify as being truly unique to UAPs versus anything else. The first is something we call instantaneous acceleration. The, the ability to go from point A to point B in a very, very quick moment where the, the forces of acceleration are, are, are beyond what we, we currently can, can replicate. So what do I mean by that? Well, when I go from here to here very quickly, there are forces that are exerted and experienced, and we call those G-forces, forces of gravity. And to put that into context, the human being can withstand probably about nine, nine Gs, G forces, for a very short period of time before we start having uh, negative uh, biological consequences like red outs, blackouts, and, and, and ultimately death. Um, because it's the forces that are experienced by the body, the body's just not able to handle it. To contrast that to one of our most uh, maneuverable aircraft that we have, it's an older aircraft, but it's still one of our most highly maneuverable. <clears throat> it is the General Dynamics F-16 uh, aircraft, and we, we use them in NATO as well. And this is an aircraft that can pull probably between 17 and 18 Gs before the wings begin to, to fail. You have, you have structural failure. You have uh, the limitations of our material science to, to withstand these forces begin to begin to break down. And uh, it, what we're seeing with these UFOs, in contrast to that, these things are being able to pull four, five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred Gs instantly. Um, so, so when you see a technology able to do that, um, it's certainly something well beyond anything we have. The second observable is hypersonic velocity. So let's take our airplane here again. Hypersonic velocities are those speeds that are defined by Mach 5 or above by definition. So the speed of sound times five plus. When you are traveling at that speed, there are all sorts of consequences and signatures associated with that. First of all, you have friction and heat ablation off the nose and off of the leading edges. You also have atmospheric ionization, which is the stripping of the electrons from the atmosphere. You also have contrails, visual signatures, uh, like, you know, if you will, the, the exhaust. And then, of course, you have acoustic signatures like sonic booms and sound. These things are able, in some cases, to travel not just Mach 5, but up to 13,000 miles an hour and do that in low atmosphere conditions where the air friction coefficients are, are very, very restricted. Uh, we have a very tough time. Uh, there's very few things we have in an inventory that can go Mach 5, um, let alone that speed. The third observable is a little bit of a uh, contradiction, but it's low observability. It's hard to see it with gun camera footage. It looks fuzzy. It's hard to see it with radar. We get this weird nonsensical returns. And even to the naked eye, you'll hear the people say, you know, I saw this object. It was metallic, but I can't describe it because it doesn't look like anything that we, we have at all. The fourth uh, observable is what we call transmedium travel, the ability to operate in multiple different environments without sacrificing performance characteristics. So to put this into perspective, an aircraft looks like an aircraft because it's designed to fly in our atmosphere. So it has a nose, it has a tail, it has a rudder, it has wings, elevators, ailerons to control itself. And then you have a, a jet engine. Whereas a rocket, which spends most of its time in a vacuum environment, 
low Earth orbit or, or higher, uh, doesn't use wings because there's no, there's no reason to. There's no atmosphere. There's no, you can't use a jet engine. So a rocket has thrusters and a rocket uses chemical engines to, 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 uh, to maneuver uh, in, in those environments. And then a submarine looks like a submarine because it's designed to be underwater. And it neither looks like a plane or a rocket. In fact, it uses a propeller to mechanically displace water and it uses buoyancy to go up and down. And imagine now if you had a submarine that could fly and also go into space. Um, that's unusual. We as mankind, we do have some technologies that can operate in multiple domains, environments, but it's always a performance sacrifice. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a seaplane, a plane that can both fly and land on water. But when you look at a seaplane, it is neither a very good airplane, nor is it a very good boat uh, because it's a design compromise. And so the more environments you want to operate in, the more of a compromise it becomes. Um, and yet these things that we're seeing uh, don't seem to have that, that compromise. So it's, it's a game changer. And then the last observable is, uh, as you say, uh, positive lift or anti-gravity. Now, there's only three fundamental ways we know how to defy the natural effects of Earth's gravity. One is through uh, balancing the forces of thrust, lift, drag, and weight. And when you do that, you can fly. You create lift and you fly. Yeah. Another way is through sheer ballistics. I can put enough energy, force equals mass times acceleration, and I can blast something out of a tube, like a mortar, like a rocket, like a firework, and blow it out of a tube. And then eventually what goes up comes back down and the last way we know how to defy earth's gravity for the most part is is through buoyancy or lighter than air so think of helium think of hydrogen think of hot air balloons where the density inside that that compartment is less than outside and therefore it rises up kind of like oil on water but that's it uh, and yet these things are able to defy our gravity without wings without control surfaces without uh, any type of obvious signs of propulsion. So is the it, question is, how are they? Yeah, my, I, I have a little theory. Uh, maybe they're not defying gravity. Maybe they're using gravity because gravity is pulling us to, to Earth. It's a magnet, right? But if you like put two magnets to, uh, towards each other, you know, you can actually, it almost hovers basically, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, what if, what, if, what if it was even a little simpler than that? What if, if, if the ability to can't, so what is gravity? Gravity is really a, a warping of, as we now know oh. through, through Einstein. Excuse oh, me one that. second. I think uh, my wife just came home. I have to open the door. <laughs> so <laughs> Sure. <laughs> no worries. And in the meantime, folks, I'll tell you a little joke. How about that? What is the difference between in-laws and outlaws? Outlaws are usually wanted. Let's see if I have another joke for you. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries, Max. I told your audience a little joke. <laughs> okay. I'll see that later. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so, so we, yeah, we look, have... you know, we're talking about gravity. So, you know, there were three fun. There, there's up, up until recently, there was only one fundamental model for, for, for science. And that was Newtonian science, where we all understand about gravity falling from the tree and, force equals mass times acceleration and whatnot. Then last century along comes this guy named Einstein with the crazy hair, and he proposes the theory of relativity where we now realize space and time are actually connected. They're not two different things. They're actually connected intimately, and they're flexible. You can actually stretch space time. Uh, and then now, over the last 30 years, four years, we have the introduction of quantum physics which is yet another bizarre layer upon our reality, but yet it is, it is very true. And it explains the universe at the very small levels. And once uh, there was a gentleman who described uh, quantum physics this way, a dog walks into a box and out walks two cats. Doesn't make sense. And yet that's what we're seeing, uh, you know, from an from a observation perspective. I think I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in essence, we have we have we have three types of science that are all true and correct. And when you look at gravity and what gravity is, we assume this is gravity. When I let the pen go, it falls. But that's not really gravity. That is a result 
of gravity. Gravity is really the warping of space time. And that warping of space time creates this, we can call it an attractive force, but it, it, it may not even be that at all. It may be something even much more bizarre, but, but for argument's sake, uh, if you had the ability to negate or neutralize the effects of Earth's gravity, in essence, pretend like Earth isn't even here, then the way you experience space-time would fundamentally be different than the way outside. So if you were able to successfully create a bubble around you right now in your studio and insulate yourself from the effects of Earth's gravity, a couple of things would happen. First of all, you wouldn't need wings or engines to float because gravity no longer affects you there. Secondly, it, you would have the ability to move around in space time, but from the outside observer, I would see you performing things that seem to be unbelievably crazy. But in reality, for, from your perspective, you're just behaving normally and I and everybody else outside your bubble is, is walking in slow motion. So it's, it's both are real, but they're relative to each other. And so a lot of the, the observations we're seeing, the observables may very well be uh, a result of someone or something has now the technology to manipulate the space time construct in a localized area and that is why we are able to see the five observables the way we do. Okay. Well, that was a very, very uh, educated uh, uh, <laughs> explanation. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. So I'm going to uh, ask you just one uh, last question. Um, and that is, of course, we have the 180-day the, the ultimatum. Um, what, are you, what are your expectations on that? Are we, is there really something going to be disclosed to the general public or is it uh, going to be very disappointing? <laughs> uh, neither. Uh, I, I'm very careful to manage expectations. Um, you know, first of all, I don't think 180 days is long enough uh, to, to provide a comprehensive report to Congress. Uh, it takes longer in some cases to remodel someone's kitchen than it does to, to provide this report. So uh, I think... Um, if, if I was in charge for the day, I would provide an interim report to Congress as I expected and as I deserve. And then I would request a, an extension and, uh, and with a promise to, to provide a much more comprehensive report, do a very deep data call within the U.S. government and our friends and our allies and, and, and provide a comprehensive report back to Congress uh, and, and probably, probably with a classified annex. Um, that will provide a lot of details to Congress uh, and then allow the American people to the greatest extent possible have access to the, the information um, that we already have, um, as long as it doesn't compromise national security or, or, or sources of methods. Of course. So uh, we know there's a new UAP task force at the moment, right? Um, mm -hmm. Have they ever approached you uh, for some intel or maybe... Uh, I. I I can't go into that. I'm sorry. I can't. I, great, again, great question. You're asking <laughs> fantastic questions, but I, uh, I'm not at liberty to discuss what, if any, relationship I might or might not have with, with and elements I, of the U.S. And I completely respect that. Uh, and by the way, you know, if you, you know, want to disclose anything, I'm the guy. <laughs> 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 um, Very <okay>. good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me see. Um, Mr. Elizondo, um, I think I'm out of questions. Uh, maybe you would want to Max, yeah. let me, if I may say to you and your audience, first of all, sincerely and most heartfelt, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Also, let me, let me congratulate you for being on the right side of history. Uh, oh, thank you, sir. I know this is a, a, an unpopular topic. Um, believe me, I, I, I get it. I I but get a lot of abuse. <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing the right thing. Um, you know, there was a time when the church refused to look through Galileo's telescope uh, in order for him to prove that the earth was not the center of the solar system. And of course, Copernicus and whatnot. But um, change is tough. 
change is tough and it takes uh, the courage of people like you to, to have uh, a, an open and honest conversation uh, with your, your fellow citizens. And I want to, I want to tell you sincerely that um, I, I know it's not easy and, uh, but I will tell you, you're absolutely doing the right thing. And, and that truth is coming out. And at hmm. some point people are going to recognize that and, and hopefully they'll come back to you and thank you for, for your contributions. So on behalf of all of us uh, on the outside, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thank you, sir, because, you know, um, you are, uh, you know, maybe the, the first person to actually have the courage uh, to really speak out. And, you know, I know you must have compromised a lot by doing that. Um, but thank you for that. You know, that's a big sacrifice. And, uh, you know, uh, I think I see it as my duty now, uh, you know, uh, to, to spread and educate uh, people uh, on this topic. Even though I get some uh, abuse, but I don't mind, you know, that's, uh, you know, collateral damage, as you say. Sure. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, so basically, let me um, um, finish this up by uh, asking your permission to use this footage to upload as a podcast. Absolutely. Max, yeah. whatever, whatever you want to do, no problem. Okay, thank you. I might do it like in... Uh, like in in a hole without any uh, uh edits so you know people uh, whenever you want uh you know my joke was terrible when you left it wasn't bad it was just it was it was uh it wasn't a uh, a distasteful joke it was just a silly dad joke so i'm just going to preface that right now i i, I figured uh you know <laughs> oh <laughs> what the well, hell <laughs> i'm i'm known for my dad jokes uh, over here my son is five years yeah. old he hates my jokes by the way <laughs> yeah i've got the same thing. i've got a bunch of dad jokes and it's you know it's it's so yeah um okay so um i'm gonna do my best and by the way uh i'm, I'm very fortunate to to uh, have uh, been given such a big platform in holland because i have to you know thank the magazine new review they are willing to do this and by the way they're known for absolutely to be, uh, to be a little bit absolutely. rebellious <laughs> well you know my hat's off and thank thank you to 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 uh to uh, your, your media company for allowing this story to come out. Um, I think history will, will judge them uh, uh, quite positively for doing this. Yeah, and, and let me, uh, so the, the, the chief, uh, the editor-in-chief is Danny Cox from New Review, so I'm just going to throw out his name. And my two friends, Bram Rosa and Alex Griffion, who are two pioneers on the subject, you know, they run the websites, uh, the, the UFO hotline, but also... Uh, an educational website, of, of, uh, like uh, among the stories of Susterberg, Mr. Elizondo. Thank you. I've taken way too much of your time, and uh, no, no, my pleasure. Thank you. It's been my honor and, and my privilege. Thank you so much, Max. Anytime you wanna wanna have a discussion, please let me know. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, and uh, well, I hope to talk to you uh, sometime again. <laughs> you got it. Thank you, and have a good one. Take care. You too. Take care. Thank bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. If you like Fighting with Moskowitz and you want to support my content, please subscribe and, uh, you know, I'll make more.